you're good. Okay. Well, it is the noon hour, and uh, welcome to our live broadcast for History 282, uh, World War II. And I know that uh, you can hear me because we've been uh, covering some issues, and I know that you can see my screen. Uh, this is the Battle for Berlin now, uh, 1945. And so we'll do a little bit on the updates that you can get to cover uh, last week because we can be here uh, a full hour uh, today. Uh, which is uh, wonderful. And so if we look at to where we are, uh, this is week 14, and then we have two weeks left, 15 and 16, and I will be doing um, the Pacific uh, Theater uh, in the remaining uh, sessions that we have. So next week we'll uh, be here, and we'll be here week 16 uh, from noon to one. And then the following week is exam week. Uh, that starts uh, for everyone, uh, and that is the week of May 17th, and there are no classes during final exam week, so there'll be no live broadcast uh, after the next two. We'll do 15 and 16 and focus on the uh, Pacific Theater. Now, during week 16, um, on Wednesday, May 12th, I will open up the uh, study questions uh, for the essay part of the exam. Then uh, a week later, so get them a week in advance, a week later on uh, the 19th of May, I will open up the link where you can submit the three essays and submit the responses uh, to the work you've been doing, either on a World War letter, on a submarine, or uh, B-17, and so that's the kind of direction of where we'll be. Now make sure that uh, we don't want to spend a lot of time reviewing the uh, the work on that paper, but those questions need to be fully uh, answered. You need to meet the page um, qualifications, the play, page requirements that I have, at least a minimum on of one page, and then you look through, it'll tell you the number of pages uh, for the uh, World War II letter that you're working on. And so you'll have plenty of time uh, to do that. I will also open up uh, the modules from the from the second exam forward so you can go back and review some things. If you're here for the collaborate sessions, uh, these sessions will give you takeaways. These you can jot down and you can write on these as well. Uh, those that are some reason uh, opt out. Uh, there'll be questions from uh, the readings, uh, the podcast, and from the media clips. Uh, so that's uh, those will be coming uh, when I open everything up on uh, May uh, 12th. All right. So I think that uh, gives you uh, an idea. You need to continue to follow the timetables for the questions that you're working on or your research. Uh, you need to follow the timetables uh, that were uh, set up for uh, submitting uh, different items uh, that we have for the questions. There, that's important, like that. So make sure you read through everything and uh, continue the work uh, in the modules that are there. There are readings. There's some excellent readings, excellent uh, things from the BBC that are up there, and keep working. Um, you know, with those very specific modules, uh, they're important. Follow the sequence. Go through those modules uh, that are there. Watch the uh, the media clips. Uh, listen to the podcast and do the reading because that's where these questions are going to uh, originate from. You know, they're they're pretty important uh, for you. All right, and then the research paper, uh, the work you're doing. Make sure that double space the paper are numbered and uh, move away from using it was and were and the word which and stay away from pronouns like that and the word stuff and don't use lot low t stay away from those avoid personal pronouns abbreviations contractions uh, those items now if you have things lined up uh, for this week what you can do is you can uh, easily uh, submit a draft copy i put a link under assignments and if you have a draft copy at the end of the day on sunday i'd be happy to take a look at it um, 
and get it in on Sunday. I'll try to get it back to you Monday or Tuesday, and then you'll have the rest of week 15 and week 16 to make the necessary uh, upgrades or corrections, whatever I may um, provide uh, to you. Uh, some of you were uh, interested in that uh, as well. Now, if you're looking for some key people, uh, whether it's on the submarine or B-17 or your World War II person, um, the best way to do that is to look at some local newspapers and say, well, what do you mean? So if you know the town where your individual person was born or the, some of the crew members or who was on the submarine, uh, look at the hometown newspapers. They generally will have some things. You know, well, that's a lot of work. Well, I know it's a lot of work, but you can, there's a bridge to that. Uh, you can email the library of the town if it's not New York City, for example. You could even try the New York Public Library. Email the library uh, looking for a reference librarian and say, I'm looking for information on this plane, this uh, submarine, this soldier, or this captain of this submarine or this captain of this plane, can you help me? And they have the person came from the community. It's more than likely that they'll have a, what we call vertical files and clippings and things about that uh, individual. That's part of the, the research. You've got to get out there and look for them. You can also find them in the United States Census, 1930, 1940. And so how old were they in 1940? Right. What you do is contact your local library and say, I'm looking for this person in this state, I think in this town, and I'm looking for the census to find his or her family. Can you help me? If not, you got to go to the Harper Library as well. The local library should. They have access to those census records. They'll be able to help you. Look for online newspapers like that. In Dealey in World War II, there's, I've been, you know, corresponding a lot with the World War II Museum in New Orleans. They've got some fantastic programs and resources. You could email uh, uh, the World War II Museum and see. I'm sure that not students aren't emailing them uh, at this point. Also, you could look at uh, the best way to find it is your books. And I unfortunately don't have any, but when I was extremely young. They were all piled up on a coffee table, and I never paid much attention to them. You know, in high school and college, you have yearbooks. Well, in the military, uh, when the war ends in 45, 46, the military, whether you're in the Army Air Corps or you're in the Navy or the Coast Guard or you're in the, uh, the Army, Army Air Corps, whatever it is, they published, they put together yearbooks. And what they did is they got pictures of all the soldiers from their unit, uh, the planes, and took group pictures, and they published a, a lot of them, and they sent them to all the soldiers. And for a long time, um, uh, I, my grandmother, uh, my father's side, had him sitting on this table, the living room table. Um, and I was very, very young. I paid no attention. I just remember the pictures of them. They were all ships because two of them were on ships like that. They were thick. I couldn't even lift them up. I don't know whatever happened to them. But uh, you can find them online, you, you, not to, to buy. or Somebody may have scanned one, and it's there, and it'll give you – uh, material that you'll never find anywhere else uh, depends on who had that yearbook because you know what you do with a yearbook you have a you go to a reunion to get it and then all your buddies are there so you have them write things in the yearbook you won't find those in any textbooks i'll guarantee you that because i've looked at some of these yearbooks and i thought uh, i've seen the ones that uh, they were in new guinea and telling me the whole this whole story about new guinea and what they were eating and and um uh, who got hurt and um when i go back home i want to go back to the hardware store i mean it's just like really enlightening kinds of content that's there and so that's the kind of research you, you need to do uh, to help you uh, and that's what i'm here for is the guide to, to do that because i've used a lot of these sources but uh, so you're dealing with something and the the whole map isn't in front of you so you've got to take it a piece at a time so it's like, well, I looked and can't find anything. I mail back, where'd you look? Well, I, I looked in my textbook. Well, your textbook won't, won't have it. Did, did you look online? Oh, yeah, it, it's too confusing. Well, did you put the soldier's name in? Did you put the plane's name in? You got to get to the Army Air Corps sites, get to the Navy sites, their historical sites. Those are good, but they're just kind of 
on the surface. You've got to get into, you know, primary source pieces like the yearbooks. Um, I don't know if anybody where if there's ever a complete collection of those yearbooks, but there's group pictures in there that I've never seen anywhere else that have been published because the soldiers, the sailors, airmen, whatever it is, all donated some pictures, those yearbooks, and they were their personal pictures. So there's, they're just not the Army Air Corps or the Signal Corps pictures that you see over and over in all these movies, which uh, they don't really get into the primary footage that still exists out there and that's never been looked at. But anyway, those are some of the things that you need to uh, work on, okay? And then keep reading in the Gilbert book, keep going through the podcast, watch all the C-SPAN material out there. It's important. That's where our questions are going to come from. All right, with that, then, I think I've covered everything. Um, if there's material that's due, um, it's coming up tomorrow on April 30th. Uh, you can get that uh, in to me. I believe it's questions 10 and 11 uh, for your work on your uh, plane submarine soldier. Uh, get those in. And I'll be happy to take a look at them and get back to you in the same way with the any work that you have relative to uh, a draft copy. All right. With that, I'll turn it over to you questions, comments, and then I'll give you the takeaway for today, and then I'm gonna, we're going to get into Berlin. Uh, uh, I noticed, I, I noticed that, uh, at the, on the Harper Library site, they had Ancestry.com when you were talking about the census. Uh, that's certainly a quick way to find census data if you need it. Uh, through that right good yes they the harper has that and if you need help just you know email the library text them call them whatever it is and they can um, help you run that down the other and i think i saw some of that robert in your civil war there's a lot of military service records out there and you'll say well you can't get them uh what you can get is you can get their dog tag number and if you have that um Serial number, if you put that into search engines, they'll identify the soldier and might take you to some family websites or a relative who added that soldier to a website. But you can get those. You search World War II military records. I've searched them because it'll tell you when they enlisted and what their job was uh, before. The ones I found uh, not, weren't related to my family, but they listed them as laborers, uh, which means uh, they were crafts, you know, they were carpenters, things like that. The military just listed them as doing labor um, like that. So we don't know what kind of labor they did until you find them in a newspaper article or you find them in the census and it'll say what they were employed doing. Uh, and census records are useful. So good good point, Robert. That's the, that's the way to do it. Um, these are important people and we want, them, we want them to come to life as much as we can and uh, give them credit for uh, their service. Um, and uh, kind of tell the story. Um, good point. All right. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? Anything I can help you with at this point? Okay. So, uh, if there's anything comes up during the uh, rest of the class that they just, uh, you know, break in, say, Professor Arkers, I have a question. I'll stop, try to answer it for you. Uh, then we'll move forward. We're going to send me an email after two o'clock. I'll try to get to those as well. All right, today the, the takeaway then is uh, significance is the Battle uh, of Berlin. So when you leave today, you should know why the Battle of Berlin was really significant and how timely uh, it is for us even today. So well, it's a long time ago, 1945. <laughs> yeah, no, it's relevant. The Battle for Berlin. So why is it significant? What is it about Berlin that uh, these Russians were interested in? You know, why didn't we got there early, long before the Russians? And uh, we didn't get there. You got Eisenhower got within 35, 40 miles, and then he turned all of the forces to the, the flanking sides and just waited. So, well, we'll see. We'll see what's going to happen today. Uh, one area I spent time working on uh, over the years is Berlin as 1945, not so much after the war, a little bit, uh, I can go about 1950 on it, but it's this period of uh, um, 
1940, 1945, okay? Well, the Russians view it even today uh, as their sacred victory. There's a story here as to what happened. Yeah, for the Russians, it was their sacred victory. But where does that come from? It goes back to World War I. It's the Russian steamroller. That's what Stalin called it. Okay. Sacred victory. Now, this is 2021, it's still called Russian's sacred victory. Uh, victory over what? And they don't mix any words. Fascist beasts. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So the fighting here on this front, you all hear about it. And yeah, people, well, don't go to the, you know, the Russian front, the Eastern front. What in the world is going on there? There's big interest in Berlin. Now, the issues of Berlin 1945 are issues well into the years 2000, 2005. Mm -hmm. Battles by historians, by Russians by the British, by the U.S., by others. And it's more than just historians. It gets into the State Department. It gets to our presidents as well because there's disagreements and there's disagreements on what? On the battle itself. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And the Russians, not only uh, uh, with Stalin, uh, and Brezhnev and Gorbachev, but even with Putin, about what's written about what the Russians were doing and how they were fighting the Germans uh, in Berlin, leading up to Berlin and after Berlin. And it gets into the embassies, and it's hard to get documents out of those. Our government, all these governments, everybody thinks World War II is over. Well, the fighting is over. The fighting in the, in the field, if you call it, but the fighting as to really what happened is still going on. And what's going on about it is even today, um, from time to time, the, the Russian ambassador to the United States and to the one in Britain and Belgium and France, you know, uh, they're concerned about every book that's published about not only the Battle of Moscow, but the Battle of Stalingrad and especially the Battle of Berlin. And uh, to them, it's very sacred. And even if it, if all the World War II veterans in the in Russia today or the former Soviet Union are dead, they still don't want certain things written about that. I mean, it is it's a hot topic. You don't think so? We don't read about it in the newspapers. But these ambassadors uh, in the U.S. and other places invite individuals of, let's use Britain because it's too close to here. Uh, so the, the Russian ambassador to the Great Britain will call in some uh, British author and they'll have lunch and then they'll talk and um, could we see a copy of your book? Um, and could we have some comments on it before it's published? Uh, we're concerned about some things. They do it in a nice way. They do it in the typical Russian way. It doesn't have anything to do with communism. The czars would have done the same way. You know, it's a very um, light-handed touch, and they can get real heavy-handed as well because this is sensitive to them. Most people say, well, this is old history. Oh, it's not. No. There's a lot of questions we still have about what's going on, right? And so how all this got started is that uh, what was happening uh, from 1945 up until the time of Gorbachev is that evidence uh, from the state archives of the Russian Federation. So this is beyond Gorbachev. This is Putin period. Um, documents got leaked out and they shouldn't have. And uh, they didn't like it. No. Mm -mm. No, they didn't like it at all. And what do these documents reveal? Well, they revealed some things that they didn't want the rest of the world uh, to know about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're concerned about. These documents have been floated around, and they're real. If they weren't, they wouldn't have paid any attention to them. You see, the Russians are different because uh, if it's false, um, they're not going to do anything. But if it's real, oh, they're, they're active. And there's no question as to why four or five different uh, 
uh, ambassadors from the Russian Federation are concerned about books being published. That isn't for fun. They're, they're really concerned because the information in there is probably really accurate and they don't want it out and they don't know how to cover it up to get it out. They can't buy all the books and burn them. Um, but on a couple, they've actually got the people to revise them and take things out uh, of those books. And so these documents reveal a lot, and I, I don't have time. I have to do a two or three sessions to go into all of it. Uh, but I know what the, some of them are. I know what the, because I've, I've looked at it. I've, I've seen the books. I've seen what they're talking about, what these ambassadors in their lunches are trying to do. And there are some in Britain that told the authors, don't go to the lunch, don't have a press conference, don't be on Russian television or radio talking about these books. People and their family are real sensitive about it. And so one of them is a spy, Barry in Russia. If you don't know him, he's in charge of a lot of that. He had a huge spy network. They really infiltrated, uh, I, as far as we know, the Manhattan Project uh, in the United States. After that, Operation Paperclip, they knew what was going on with the Saturn rockets. They just knew a whole lot. They had moles uh, at Pinamunde that even the Germans didn't know about. And what happened is we got all the, a lot of those Pinamundi people, and we got the Russian moles who were Germans but working for the Russians there. And sometimes they could get things out, sometimes they couldn't. So Barry has got a huge spy network. So when these documents got out, and who the archivists were, I, I don't know, but uh, I have a hunch they're not there anymore. Uh, I don't even know their names, but somehow they were misfiled in, the, in folders, and historians got a hold of them who could Russian and could translate it and began to verify it and start running some of these people down that were still alive. And they said, oh, yeah, that's exactly true. How'd you find that out? And part of it is this is the, the Russian is called Operation Borodino. Like, wow, what's that? Well, you can, you know, you'll get a little uh, definition of that. Um, and what it is, it's, I call it Operation Ketchup. Yeah. What, that, what is that? Well, Operation Borodino is the, the Russian, the Soviet direction to create atomic weapons. And it was oversaw by Beria himself. And we know from these documents that Beria, from his spy network, they knew about the Manhattan Project. They probably knew a lot more than uh, Truman or Eisenhower or FDR would ever admit to. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so one of the documents talks about April 1945, where Beria, who is the head of the state secret police, and they're good, uh, sent an NKVD rifle division uh, into Berlin. These are their special forces. And the NKVD all gets this image, and I've covered it in Moscow and it's in a lot of the books, that they're just a bunch of murderers, killers, and cutthroats. And that's true, they are. But this group, no, 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 no. No. Barry has sent them into Berlin. And this is why Stalin wanted uh, Berlin at all costs, you know, with the West. There's research in Berlin, atomic research in Berlin. That's where it was. The rocketry is up in that island area, Pina Munde, and they all talk about that, but they don't talk about the labs in Berlin and their major labs that are there. So Barry has got his secret police, this NKVD rifle division, uh, into Berlin to get all German atomic research data. He wanted that. Okay. That's what he's after. Most, I can't say all, but the documents, most of Germany's atomic research was done in Berlin. The Russians in those files had maps. They knew the exact building. They knew all of that. And now the Russian drive is to take Berlin first all-out effort, 
don't want anybody else there because Stalin wants that information. Mm -hmm. That's one of the key reasons. Uh, whether I don't think Eisenhower knew that. Um, but for, we know he pulls back. I mean, the Germans wanted him to go in. He got it within 30, 40 miles, and he stopped, and what the Russians pounded out until they did something, and then something they did, they surrounded all of Berlin. This is what Stalin wanted. Mm -hmm. So why did Stalin want Zhukov and Konev to surround the city before striking? To make sure nobody else gets out, nobody else gets in. He was worried about that. We had spies there as well, and one of them were informed that were, they were Swedish, uh, and they had, we had planted them there, I think. They may have been there um, in the 20s, 30s, but uh, they were more German than the Germans, and they were providing information to us on a regular basis because they were in major towns that were shelled. Uh, or by the British dropping what I covered last week, all this carpet bombing. And the reason why we were concerned about where they were bombing is because we had our agents there. We needed this information, and and we got it. And uh, I'll tell you the file that's really uh, uh, one that uh, uh, our spies and our uh, key people there reported that the Russian Kansars or the party had uh, they were German and or Russians. They were had Berlin divided up into different cells where these communist cells were located. They had lists of SS officers. They had they had followed them. They knew exactly where they lived and and what role they had. All of that on that list. And then when the time came, they were supposed to go out and just literally tear these people apart. And, and we were getting that information as it was coming out by at least I know this one Swedish man, and I think he had his family there. Every day he'd walk this dachshund around the bombed out area and go get his something in the morning for breakfast. And the rest of the civilians had no idea, and the Gestapo and the rest of those had no idea that this guy was uh, uh, getting us information. However, out I have no idea. I haven't seen any of that, and so. It gives you a little bit of insight. I really was intrigued by these Russian these cells because I had no idea that the communists had infiltrated Berlin that much. And that's one reason um, that it was bombed so heavily that Stalin was furious about that because he did these buildings. He wanted to see what they were working on. And uh, there's names for the buildings. So this is Berlin. This is the battle, okay? So for the last 10 or 15 years, now take 20. 2005 and add 15 to it and you can see where we are russians are using historians of slander against the red army okay we we'll say well you know they were furious and like that but it's not the it's not the mainline red army people don't understand that if you study the berlin and, and there's a lot finally coming out uh, about it is that the troops that came in, and I saw some pictures, I found a couple the other day, I didn't have a chance to get them all in here. You know, the, these Russian troops were handing out bread. And people said, well, that's just a photo op. No, 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 the Russian Red Army, the real professional Russian soldiers weren't all those beasts and monsters. The beasts and monsters came behind the Red Army that turned loose in Berlin. And those soldiers, Russian soldiers didn't like that either. But what happens is the whole Red Army gets slandered after the war and then when we go home people in these towns and cities are wondering well, you didn't do that did did you do that ivan did you do those things he says no we didn't do that we just how we fought you know we didn't do any of those things like that he said, those might have been groups that came after us he's not every russian soldier knew what was going on and how Stalin was doing this this cleanup work so you'll see this battle that's going on even today so what happens for Berlin, this is uh, Russian uh, revenge is, is what it is. Now in Berlin, the people in Berlin wanted revenge against the French and they really wanted Paris to be blown up, but the Germans refused to do that even though when they were ordered to do that. Well, now Russians want revenge on Berlin uh, based on what they did at, uh, in Moscow and Stalingrad and all of the others because of the you know, this back and forth, who's really the beast here and these kinds of terrible atrocities. 
you know, that you see taking place. All right. So Germany uh, tried to eliminate, this is what, you know, uh, the West generally says, that Germany tried to eliminate Bolshevism, but they ended up in bringing it to all of Europe and to the West. You know, we, we know that. And that's when the war is over. Uh, the Russians don't want to go home. You know, they're there and, you know, they keep the Warsaw uh, states. Uh, they set up all this, this pact and they're into East Berlin. Uh, they're into East Germany. They're into all of that. Okay. Stalin had one interest in Berlin. Mm -hmm. And that was getting all the atomic information that he possibly could from the Germans. How much of it they got, I can't tell you. I can tell you how many were in this uh, division. Um, we know the buildings, but, uh, you know, whoever got those files that got the information, um, it, it's because under Truman's administration, he's going to announce that the United States has had evidence that the Soviet Union had some kind of a nuclear test. He announces that, I think, on September 23rd uh, during his during his administration. Uh, that this happened, but this is Stalin's one interest in Berlin. That's why he's there. As the rest of the, the troops pass through, and then you get the rest of this other groups that come through, whether they're partisans or, or just uh, reserves or civilians uh, being part of this. He had six million men ready to to move into uh, Germany, and so we know there are Russian spies in the U.S. How many? Um, don't know. They were here, and so Stalin's getting a lot of information, and that's generally what he wants. So, somewhere along the line, um, they had been working on recruiting them, um, and a lot of it. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I, I picked up that uh, finally they released some of these documents. Is that we had a lot of Russians over here uh, along uh, the East Coast uh, and the West Coast, and we were training them with certain kinds of uh, material uh, for fighting and training like that. And we never admitted to that, but in the last four or five years we have. And I'm thinking, um, because people in the towns would see these Russians come into their town, you know, if you're on the coast of Florida or, or North Carolina, along that of Texas and these areas, and, and then they were told, they don't say anything about that, and they, and they didn't. But years later, it, it, it all that kind of leaks out. They were wondering what they were doing over here. A lot of it had to do with aircraft, is to build up their early capacity to create aircraft. And so there could have been a few of them dumped in there as well. Not sure, but maybe, because uh, we don't know. But there, there's no question about that. The Soviet documents tell us that. They probably told us who they all were as well, but uh, that file either was destroyed. I don't think they destroyed it. They just aren't letting it out uh, like that. And so in Berlin in 1944-45, there's something called mysterious fatalism. Uh, you won't see it anywhere else quite like that. The fatalistic for them. Um, you were denounced if you spoke of defeatism. Okay, you couldn't do that. No, couldn't couldn't do that at all. Right? No, that's a big issue with them. Um, and so. Uh, there's a lot of this ideas as to what they're doing uh, during this um, uh, a fatalism. Um, and uh, when the air raid shelters came, uh, they all came to the uh, air raid shelters. Uh, and uh, on the air, air raid shelters, this was written in German, it's just the abbreviation, but the German that would translate it out as this, this the LSR would translate learn Russian quickly. These are the air raid shelters. You know, learn it quickly. Well, you know, this is 44, you know, this is 45, like that, okay? That's a test. Learn Russian quickly, all right? And so what else is happening? Um, okay, the greeting is gone. You know, the the greeting of the Third Reich when you saw somebody, the military, the Hitler Youth, all using that, it was gone by the beginning of 44. If somebody came from another town or another community and walked into a store and gave that greeting and salute, the rest of the people would look, turn and look, 
you'd feel uh, an ant. So if you see movies and say, well, this is Berlin in 1944-45, and, the, and there's people going around with that greeting, they stopped, they stopped it. They didn't use it. No. Mm -mm. It's gone. The evidence is all over the place for that. And they knew you were new. You were new German or new to the town because they're coming into Berlin. And they'd look at it and they'd kind of shake their head and you'd kind of apologize and you wouldn't use it anymore. You'd just walk in and, and say good morning, good afternoon. But they had no interest in that greeting whatsoever. You have to remember Berlin gave the National Socialist Party the lowest vote uh, of all. Uh, the vote, strong vote for the National Socialist Party came in from the rural areas, the smaller villages, smaller communities, smaller towns, and very small cities. The bigger cities had no interest in it, lowest possible vote, and there they sit. It's an dichotomy. They don't support the party. But what are you going to do? You can wipe out your own people, which they did anyway, but these folks just aren't going to do it. Greeting is gone. No. Hitler Youth, by this time in Berlin, there's a thousand of them. They stopped, even stopped using it. Yep. But I can tell you what they were using when they came in. I give you the English word for it. This is the greeting if you're in Berlin, starting on usually January 1st is when they make a lot of the New Year celebrations and New Year's resolutions. Now, I'm sure a few people used it. Don't, you know, I don't want to say 100% didn't. So when they see the movies, maybe they just happen to do that. But what they do is they don't give you the true reality of what Berlin is like. Berlin is different than any other German city at this time because of what's going on. And so the greeting was survive. Frau, Fraulein, whatever it is, uh, the, the word would be survive. They knew what was coming. All right. That's what they're, that's what they're working on. Okay. Wow. The largest bunker uh, in Berlin, as far as you know, there might have been others that still haven't come up. There's still a lot of things that we don't know about, all the tunnels and where everybody was located. Remember, the Reichstag was destroyed, uh, uh, was burned down uh, uh, when Hitler was in power in the 30s. And uh, in all the films, you see that. And uh, the Russians even asked after the war, they said, well, wh wh why are you filming that? Because we didn't destroy that. Why are you saying that we destroyed this? Because this was burned, they burned it or somebody else burned it. You know, this is what we did over here. Those buildings, a lot of those buildings were destroyed and the, um, the Germans from 33 on, when those uh, buildings are burned uh, until 1939 for that three year period, they don't rebuild them. And all the movies show that and you say, wow, look at all that destruction that the Russians did. And they didn't like that because they didn't do that. They said the Germans burned it on their own. So give them credit for that. Um, you know, we're into the streets and this house starts fighting and other things like that. They all destroyed a lot of buildings. Plus a lot of it was bombed by the, by the British. And so when they fly over, show all of that, you know, this is why the Russians get angry about it. Even those, you know, the descent, you know, that the, their children and grandchildren of those that served in the, the Russian army they said well we didn't fly over and do that that was the british and they all throw us in there in the u.s and we did carpet bomb i think once or twice i gave you some of that last week in berlin and those orders came directly from the president of the united states and um little and others uh didn't like that order at all and didn't want to do it but then it was done There's a lot more to to write on that so the zoo bunker is the is the largest one now, if you happen to be non-German and you were, uh, this is not a prisoner of war, you're working in Germany and uh, you're from another country, you were not allowed into this bunker. Uh, no. Mm -mm. Couldn't do it. Um, you would have letters painted on your clothes uh, that identified you as a letters and an ID, and that meant you were not to be allowed into the underground bunkers. So you could stay outside and enjoy the bombing or hide or whatever you wanted to do. And that's why a lot of them were buried uh, in the rubble. And when they pulled them out, they had all these insignias on their back because they identified them as a non-German from whatever country they were in. A lot of work needs to be done on that as to how many were there and what happened to them. Lavatories. 
Okay. Come on. Laboratories in the bunkers uh, were closed. Mm. I'm thinking of sanitation problem. Worse than that. And people would go in there and kill themselves. Yeah. Until you couldn't get any more into the laboratories. And so when the air raid was over and people left then another group maybe foreign workers i don't know would come into the different laboratories bathrooms uh, you know washrooms whatever you want to call them uh, they all had them in the bunkers and some of them were pretty good uh they just had to close them off and then get the people out of there and try to find you know relatives or whatever so it got to the point where they literally uh, closed them off and then uh, they would leave buckets or pails down there if people wanted to go to the washroom because they didn't want them uh, um, taking their own lives uh, in the laboratories anymore. When people went down in there, they all carried uh, what are called bunker candles. Okay, And the candles were important because you would light a small one and hold it. And if it got to the point where the candles started to go out, you had to get out of there because you didn't have enough oxygen. Um, and then what would happen on the way out, the people would eat the candles. That's terrible, isn't it? No, not necessarily, because they were usually made out of, because uh, they couldn't get the normal candles, so they made the candles out of uh, animal fats, if they could get any animal fats. So it's an old strategy. The Romans used it as well. It goes back in history, edible candles uh, like that. And so, you know, that's about the only thing they could carry, because they had to run very quickly to get into them. And as soon as they were full, uh, then they... Uh, the local um, air raid, as we call them, wardens, they were all in these major cities, would close it and lock it up. But you could, you could always get out, but nobody else could get in. And then they'd have to stand on the outside of the, uh, of the bunker uh, uh, and wait to, for the air raid uh, uh, to be over. Okay. 300,000 foreign workers had painted ID numbers or letters on their clothing. I can't confirm that number um, it could be more it could be less I'm not sure that uh, there's any number I think 300,000 is really low um, now if you look at Berlin and the bomb you see all of it and you think the whole city was destroyed but it wasn't there's suburbs to it and some of those areas weren't even touched out in the way out in Berlin one of the last areas really it, it, it was built in an area that was low-lying a lot of uh, sand, a lot of wetlands, all of those. It was the last thing of one of the great electors that set up because nobody really wanted it there. Um, and that's basically where this group settled uh, that created over time this city called uh, Berlin. And so it spreads out with a radius. And a lot of it was destroyed, but it, you don't get the picture as to what what was happening further out from the, the city in these smaller areas where these people lived because they'd managed to go out there and they could get milk and they could get food and certain things they needed, but it'd be a hike for them. You know, it's like driving from the lakefront all the way out to, you know, Geneva or Oregon, Illinois to get the foodstuffs that you needed and you didn't have enough fuel to do it anyway. So you'd either have to walk or get a horse uh, to do it or pay somebody out there to do it like that. Okay. So Berlin, as early as 1933, was anti-nationalist uh, socialist party. Uh, they didn't like it at all. Um, a large number of them, um, between 60 to 70 percent, some say as high as 73 uh, percent, no interest in the socialist party, national socialists. Okay. Now, Berlin stories, there's a whole bunch of them from a propaganda point of view that's really interesting. And, and uh, one was that... Uh, Germany has this new wonder, uh, all these wonder weapons, but it was uh, one that uh, you know, they were going to capture the entire first United States Army because a plane was going to fly over and 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 drop this gas. And it's, it's like an anesthesia. All the soldiers would go to sleep, and then the Germans would go out and round them all up and hold them a hostage uh, like that. Wow. But some of them had a better idea. We're going to hold the first army for ransom. And we want to make sure we get food. But before that, we want to get full. 
That's what Albrecht Speer wrote about and talked about like that. Okay. And so based on what's been happening with the uh, carpet bombing and those activities, the Berliners wanted the destruction of Paris. Yeah. He wanted that destruction of Paris more than anything else. These were a lot of these Berliners like that. So they were happy with the uh, carpet bombing. Um, they felt that they had a lot of bombing that took place uh, in London, uh, but Paris is, um, why should we save Paris? Uh, but it was, okay. Now if we go into some other documents a little bit here, uh, Heinz Guderian's reports from January of, well, 45, but we go back to December of 44. Uh, wow. Yeah, he's got some interesting um, reports uh, that he's giving to the German high command and a lot that goes on um, with Berlin. He's talking about what's going on in, in Berlin. Um, and he, he's pretty accurate about that. As he goes into the uh, German high command, um, um, He's giving them this this idea that um, you know what happened at the Ardennes. And this is uh, this is right when you know what we've got going here. We've got that Battle of the Bulge, um, and his analysis is, and the Berliners' view was that the Battle of the Bulge. They called it the Ardennes Offensive. You know, they're great offensive, and they were going to have more of those. Uh, the reason was is that the two great tank commanders they had there uh, were denied the fuel that they needed. And if Berlin is sacrificing this fuel, why didn't this fuel get to those tank commanders that were there? So the average Berliner would know this on the streets when this was all taking place in the fall of 44, uh, like that. And so what they're doing is using the same strategies they had with the von Monstein plan in order to break through um, in the northern part of the, you know, the great marginal after Henri marginal line. This is what they're 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 doing. So they're running the same play again, except this time they don't have the fuel and they're really out of gas uh, uh, as it took place. And you can't blame. Well, they just wanted it to. You know, Estonia, they waited there and all kinds of things. You know, somewhere along the line, there were some misallocations of fuel that was a strategic miscalculation. They spent a lot of time on that, de developing that plan, not to have enough fuel and saying, well, they had to get to uh, La Havre. They had to get to where the American supplies were to get American, right? What did those German tanks run on? What kind of fuel? I thought it was diesel fuel. How much diesel fuel did we have there? Do you think the Americans would have left the fuel there? We would have probably destroyed all of it. So this idea that you read as well, Bostonia, they just had to have it. Uh, and some of them, yes, the Germans were there, surrounded it, and oh, they couldn't get the fuel. They were they just wanted this fuel. Um, it doesn't quite fit the, the chronology. There's some issues there, okay? And so in this Ardenna, the Ardennes offensive, as Darren it gives them the report is that uh, the losses were about 80,000. And they weren't totally out of fuel, but they didn't have enough fuel to continue what they needed to do. Okay. Hmm. So what's wrong? Yeah. What's wrong is that the Germans uh, were outnumbered, is what they were. Mm -hmm. They were outnumbered on the Eastern Front and were taking troops from the Eastern Front. And he told the German high command, Guderian, in his report of January, he says, we're outnumbered 11 to 1. Uh, and the tank tank number is so high, artillery outnumbered a 20 to 1. He says, um, we, we, we can't do it. You couldn't, you didn't, you know, by moving things from the east to the west and then trying to get them back to the west, there's nothing we can move back to the west, from the west to the east. Not not good. You're in a lot of trouble here. And his reports bring that out. You got to read the reports because his is his pretty good intelligence. He's not going to lie to him. He's going to tell him like it is. But what we 
don't understand is how how German production was up in certain things. All right, let me give you a few. Spear, 212,000 rifles were produced in just one month, December of 1944. That was double the entire number, okay? And everything they produced prior to December of 1944. In just one month, 212,000 rifles produced just in one month, month of December. That was double all of everything produced from January uh, 1 of 44 all the way up to December of 44. Wow. And Spear isn't going to lie. I mean, that's that's a pretty accurate number. Okay. In the spring of 46, I may have mentioned it last week, uh, he had explained to the German high command that they could produce 100,000 machine gun pistols, which I've never read about that in, in many of the uh, histories dealing with uh, what was going on in Berlin at the end of the war here when they're getting all these reports from Guderian, um, like that. Um, Goering said, I've got 1,000 planes. I'll have an airborne offensive. We'll do all of that. There weren't 1,000 planes. So we know that he was um, he was not accurate in the things that uh, he he basically focused on. Um, so Spear is coming up with uh, issues here. German troops, uh, three million uh, uh, for the defense of Berlin uh, for what's left here on this Eastern Front, all right? And they're facing, remember they told you they were outnumbered. And uh, I'll give you the Russian uh, view uh, here. Um, Red Army's got 6.7 million troops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good number, right? Right. Yeah, they're there. Okay. The Germans on the Eastern Front uh, were called Stalin's horses uh, because they pretty much knew that uh, when the time came, um, they were going to be out in some camp uh, somewhere in Siberia, um, caring and working and doing everything for uh, Stalin. I just knew that that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to look into a little bit as to what the, uh, I have a few minutes left here. I wanted to look in to see what in the world was going on here. Who were the Germans now fighting for? See, that's a key question. Okay. Yeah. What were they fighting for? Well, most of them wrote uh, years later after the wars that they didn't want to die in a Russian camp in Siberia. And so uh, were they fighting for the Third Reich? Not really. No. Germany? No. Their family, we would think. Well, not much of that. They don't mention that. They were fighting for each other. It got down to that, those on the Eastern Front, those three million, and I'm sure there's a large number of them that you know, wouldn't answer that question one way or another, but from the surviving evidence that we have, they were fighting for themselves, which means you were gonna die fighting here or we're gonna end up in a Russian prison camp, which will be from being frozen out there because we're not coming home. They kind of sensed that after Paulus uh, surrendered. Uh, very few of the, his troops ever came back home like that. Okay. And so we know this is a pretty active uh, viewpoint that's coming from them because you you wonder what's, what's going on. And so when Guderian shows up and he's talking to the German high command, um, Keitel, who wasn't wasn't that bright, but he always would support whatever Hitler and the rest of them came up with and Gehring. So uh, Hans uh, Guderian often referred to as either tanks or the uh, um just didn't get along with him. No. And he basically tells them that by this time, he's identified through his intelligence that the Russians have over 8,000 aircraft. He says there's going to be such a battle. They they will never see anything like it again. And he said, they'll cut right through it. You know, he can't, Germany can't stop them. 
like that. And so the Russian offensive began January 12th. And they were all briefed on this by um, Guderian, January 12th, 1945, at 5 a.m. in the morning. That's Moscow time, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the German high command and Hitler and others um, were very uh, uh, negative towards Guderian. Um, and the only positive comment that came out of it, he's about ready to leave the room after they just berated him that he doesn't know what he's talking about and he's too negative and all of this isn't true and all of that. As he's turning and he's leaving, he put his hand on the door to leave the room, uh, Hitler tells him, well, I, I want to thank you for establishing a strong reserve Eastern Front, which I, Darren, as far as we know, didn't say anything. He just walked out of the room thinking, well, what does that have to do with anything? we're finished, but those are my words. That's what I think he probably would have thought in that scenario, okay? And so what we end up with is this. Uh, uh, when the attack started, the German prisoners were forced through the minefields that the Germans had put into position to slow down the Red Army. Well, it didn't slow them down too long and they didn't have to worry about feeding too many prisoners after that because they forced them into the minefield. So turn them loose and say, you go forward. If you get through, you can join your compatriots. If you don't, thank you very much. Oh, those are my words again, but uh, they forced them through the minefields. Uh, some stood and got shot. Others turned and ran through the minefields. Maybe some of them made it. We don't know. We just don't know the kinds of things that were happening uh, uh, through all of this, okay? Now, the Russians also, uh, instead of wearing socks, they, they had linen and foot windings that you see, and everybody says, oh, my goodness, look at those poor Russians. They've been doing that since the time of the czars, and it really does keep your feet much warmer than that. Uh, that's how they put them. They're called foot windings, and they're made out of linen uh, instead of using socks, which the West did uh, as, as well, okay? Okay. Um, when the Russians finally get into Warsaw, there's only 162,000 people that were left in Warsaw. That's all. The rest are gone, wounded, off in refugee camps, killed. Don't know what happened to them. They're gone. Literally, you know, they wanted Russians wondered what happened to all those people, and um, the people that were left uh, in Warsaw also were wondering what happened to the rest of those people, like that. So there's uh, a lot of tragedy uh, as they move forward. So you know that the Reichstag building was already burned um, and uh, it had been a sort of abandoned and, and fire charred and damaged for 12 years. Uh, and they knew that. And so as we look at it, at what happens here, you know, the fall of Berlin is really the end of the Third Reich. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. Russians saw it and just were stunned by a lot of it, uh, the kinds of things that uh, uh, were happening. Um, and the Russians believed by the seizure of Berlin that that is the end of the Great Patriotic War. And the reason was, as Stalin and a lot of the propaganda, the commissar said, is because the German army could no longer defend Berlin, the war is over. Well, it wasn't over for the, us or the, the specific, you know, Pacific. We've got a lot that's, that's going on here. Uh, wow. You know, yeah. what's, what's going on here? You know, greater Berlin. You know, what happened? It's the size of London. Um, we know that, got about 341 square miles. When I had to look, there were about 450 bombing raids, about 450 bombing raids, mm -hmm. like that. Wow. The city center, 78% of it destroyed. 78% of it. That's right. And tons were poured on them. Um, 
45,517 tons of bomb by the British RAF on Berlin. And so with that, that ends the war, at least in Berlin uh, for the Germans. And then the surrender and all the rest of that will come much later. All right, that's all I'll do for today. I've got to move over to another meeting uh, that I'm supposed to go to at one o'clock. But I said, I got to have my presentation today. I'll pick up uh, next week. We're going to move out.